Good morning, and welcome to Oceans Live at Chow. I'm your host, Kate Thompson, and we're back live at the fabulous museum in Washington, D.C. for day two of Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2013. If you're just joining us, the first panel session of the day finished moments ago, and it was a fascinating discussion about the future of America's fisheries. There's plenty more to come, including our daily Capitol Hill Ocean Talk roundtable at noon. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and their co-hosts, the Pew Charitable Trust, along with the rest of the event sponsors and the Chow 2013 Honorary Congressional Committee. Thank you as well to NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the University of Rhode Island Interspace Center for supporting our Oceans Live broadcasts. And of course, a big thank you to the Museum for their hospitality as a host for Chow this year. The museum offers visitors an experience that blends five centuries of news history with up-to-the-second technology and hands-on exhibits. Now I am pleased to welcome to the studio a member of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation Board of Trustees, Fred Keeley. Fred has served as the treasurer of the County of Santa Cruz since 2005. Prior to that, he represented the Monterey Bay Area and the California State Assembly and authored the Marine Life Management Act, which the Associated Press called the most significant advancement in ocean policy in 50 years. Fred, thank you so much for joining us on Oceans Live. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you for having me. It's very, very kind of you. So can you tell me, to start things off, um, what are your thoughts on Capitol Hill Ocean Week? Why is it so important? Well, as someone who doesn't live and work in Washington, D.C., and lives out on the left coast but is involved a bit in ocean work. I think what's so wonderful about this is being able to work, spend time with, discuss, join panels, have informal conversations with people who work in the ocean space in so many ways throughout the country. Folks who are marine scientists, folks who are fishers, folks who uh, are invested in their community because they have a small business mm -hmm. there, whatever it might be. Uh, government folks at the state, national, and local level, for folks to be able to have a week together to really go into some depth about public policy is a wonderful opportunity. Well, Chow is actually run by the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Recently, you joined the Foundation's Board of Trustees last year. What inspired you to become part of the organization? Well, I've done a little bit of work out in California, uh, as you mentioned, in the legislature, a little bit of work there when I, was, when I served in the legislature. Uh, but really what got me inspired about this foundation was the work that NOAA and the foundation did together to build the Visitor Exploration Center for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Santa Cruz, which is my hometown. And the folks who participated in that, from NOAA and the sanctuaries, the scientists who were involved in it, the folks who helped design it and build it, were truly inspiring people because what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to have a place where the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that can fall in love with the ocean and then become the leaders. And so that was inspiring to me and I wanted to be part of, of that good work that they're doing. Well, you mentioned the wonderful visitor center which was recently built uh, by the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and of course the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, can you talk about the role of National Marine Sanctuaries in driving tourism and economic, economic impact for local communities? I think we do a little bit of driving tourism, but I think more what we do is take advantage of the tourism that's already there. So let's use Santa Cruz as, as an example. The specific site location of the Sanctuary Exploration Center is directly across the street from the main beach and right next to the iconic Santa Cruz boardwalk. So two million people a year walk by that spot. And like the museum, we are, or like this, this uh, uh, conference we're holding, it's admission free. You can go to the National Marine Sanctuary's Visitor Exploration Center for free. So as families are walking by, uh, they can take 10, 15, 20 minutes and go in there. And that's especially important, I think, for the changing demographics of California, where we have very close to a Latino majority in our state. And by the next census, we will have a clear majority. And the importance there is for that next generation of leadership to go in, learn about the sanctuary, which they can see, uh, and which they can go in the water. But when you learn about it, really learn about it, 
then you understand it, you fall in love with it, and you become a leader in wanting to preserve and protect it uh, during your life. And so that's what we're so excited about, is taking advantage of the tourism that's already there and making sure that that tourism is an informed tourist who appreciates the sanctuary. Well, National Marine Sanctuaries are all across the United States. Uh, it, it's a National Marine Sanctuary system of uh, 13 National Marine Sanctuaries and one National Monument. Well, I was just wondering what National Marine Sanctuaries mean to you. I mean, there are four off the coast of California, in yeah. your home air, state. Can you tell us what they mean to you? Well, what they mean to me is a couple of things. One is they're non-regulatory, and that's a really important notion. Uh, I think oftentimes when uh, especially the federal government, makes some kind of designation on the land or in the water, the immediate impression is it's regulatory. And instead, the sanctuaries are something quite different than that. They are really fundamentally educational. They are a space in the ocean where we learn, we research, we study, we collaborate on best practices in a way that is not onerous, in a way that relies on folks becoming informed and educated and working cooperatively so that what we've got in those ocean spaces are the best of the management practices that can then be exported to other places in the United States coastal waters uh, as well as learning from the rest of the world and importing those good practices and best practices into that ocean space. Well, sanctuaries are America's best hope for saving the ocean, I have to say. But what can you as an inv individual do to help protect the ocean? Well, as you probably know, last night there was a, a gala dinner that the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation sponsors each year. And we give out a Volunteer of the Year award, and uh, we recognize some folks who've done wonderful things for the ocean, such as uh, Jane Lubchenco uh, last night received a Lifetime Achievement Award. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island also received an award for us from us. And when he spoke, he said something that stuck in my mind particularly. And that is, he said, the oceans can do an, a, an immense amount. Uh, they can produce resources, they can uh, feed the world, they can do all kinds of things. But there's one thing the oceans can't do, and that's speak for themselves. They cannot speak for themselves. And they're crying out, he said, during this time in particular with acidification and loss of certain fish stocks and so on. Uh, they need someone else, a whole bunch of someone else's, to speak out and cry out for the oceans. So what each and every one of us can do, whether it's the, the scuba knots who were there last night, and that's these little guys who, who uh, have their, their scuba diving licenses and then they uh, get organized by adults to go out and help us uh, count fish and do other good things, or someone who's a member of Congress or someone who's involved in their local community. Everybody can speak for the ocean because it can't speak for itself. I couldn't have said it any better. Thank you so much, Fred, for joining pleasure. us on Oceans Live. Thank you, Kate. So today is full of interesting panel sessions, starting with reducing risk to people and nature, updates from the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic, coming up right after this at 11 a.m. Eastern. Then in the afternoon, the focus shifts to the economy with a panel on how a healthy ocean promotes job creation and boosts coastal economies at 1.15 p.m. Eastern. The day will wrap up with a look at how coastal communities are taking a local approach to responding to global changes. That starts at 3.15 p.m. Eastern. Then back here in the Oceans Live studio, be sure to catch Capitol Hill Ocean Talk at noon Eastern when I will be joined by some fantastic guests including Dan LaFoley from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Sunshine Menendez from the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute, Julia Roberson from the Ocean Conservancy, and Stacy Lewis from the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Then at 2.45 Eastern, we will highlight clips from last night's Leadership Awards Dinner, a.k.a. the Ocean Prom, which you definitely won't want to miss. Stick around and enjoy the rest of Capitol Hill Ocean Week, brought to you by Oceans Live, which brings together ocean leaders from around the world to tackle the most important issues facing our blue planet. For the three days, Oceans Live is covering every minute of chow, bringing you all the fascinating speakers and thought-provoking discussions this symposium has to offer. Make sure to check us out at OceansLive.org.